the panel, we have a big panel here with seven guests, is about implementing the circular economy for the boating industry. Um, I will call uh, our panelists one by one on stage. Take a seat, but don't take this one here. This is mine where the green book is lying. Okay, thank you. Um, we saw her already this morning. We saw her already this morning. Andy Kontudaki, Policy Officer, Maritime Innovation, Marine Knowledge and Investment, European Commission. Thank you, Mark. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. thank you very much for coming. Alexander Vandenberg, Sustainability, Sustainability Manager, Wind Europe. Thomas Wegmann, Marketing Manager, Hi. AOC nice Residence and Board Member, European Com Composites Industry Association. Oh, Maybe uh, one by one, man, woman. Felicitas <laughs> Frick, colleague so, uh, of Franziska. Consultant uh, Waste and Resource uh, Management, uh, Rambol. Uh, um, so now to the next page. Al Gorsa. Yeah. Uh, Ivan. It's a brick Ivan. group. Ivan. Phil Horton, Environment, Environment Secretary, <laughs> European Boating <laughs> Association. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Kerstin Silma, Editor in Chief, Float Magazine. And, his greed is and Maria Rinstam, Founder and Owner, Bots Kroten. Sweden. Was it correct? It gets a bit of stick from Perfect. our Greek colleagues. <laughs> but you see, Phil Holton, hi. That's so, interesting presentation. Uh, Francis, uh, yeah, Maria next to me. And, uh, Perfect, you can all see me and hear me. Um, uh, the last days we had, um, we started with a short introduction by everybody. Um, what are you doing? Why are you sitting here? Maybe one, two minutes, so everybody knows in the audience and online. I mean, this is streamed online. Uh, who sits here on the panel? Um, maybe, Andy, uh, you start, and then we go of course. this round back to me. I can oblige uh, with that, since I have been already uh, up there. So my name is Andy Kondudakis, and I represent here today the European Commission, the Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, you keep the maritime affairs for your line of business, of course. And we are dealing with uh, maritime innovation, uh, knowledge and investments in the blue economy. Very good. Yes, please. Uh, so my name is Alex. I work at Wind Europe, which is the European Trade Association for Wind Energy, which makes me, I think, the odd one out on this panel. So why I'm here, maybe that will go clear in the panel, but to understand is where we're talking about here is about recycling circularity and there's actually quite some similarities between some of the materials that the boating industry and the wind industry are using and to follow up what Andy said in her introduction is how can we work together perhaps to, to make recycling really happen in both our sectors and that's why I'm here today. Okay, thank you very much. Felicitas. My name is Felicia Frick. I have a background in environmental engineering and I work at Rumble, like my colleague Francisca, who held the presentation beforehand. I work in the waste management and resource management department. I'm also yeah, passionate about waste management and circular economy. Um, this is also why I'm here today. We did the study together with like Rumble and the Fraunhofer Institute for the, environment, for the German Environmental Agency. And it was all about boat recycling and how we tackle the issue of the end-of-life boats in Germany. All right, thank you very much. My name is uh, Thomas Wegmann. I'm uh, working as a marketing manager for a company AOC, which is a residence company. I'm here uh, representing UCIA and the UCIA board. Uh, UCIA is the European Composites Industry Association. Uh, we're overlooking all the different uh, composites applications and clearly uh, promoting uh, the business uh, growth and industry growth is, is, is a key element of our, uh, of our mission. Uh, making sure that uh, there are solutions for end-of-life recycling and waste recycling in general is, is a key part yes. of the work that, that we're doing. And uh, I'll, well, there's, there's quite a few things moving at this point, and we'll talk about that in a, in a bit more detail. Okay, thank you very much. Kerstin? Very kind, thank you very much. There you go. Hello. No, I can hear you, but I'm sitting next to you. But the <laughs> microphone. Um, I think mine is. Is this in? Okay. Ah. Maybe you, you can try mine. Maybe. No, 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 don't, don't exchange because it's. 
Okay, take, take my microphone. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Sorry. You share. Uh, so my name is Kerstin Silmer. I'm editor-in-chief of Float magazine. And um, Float is an online magazine for boating, uh, German-speaking, uh, based in Berlin. And uh, we are writing a lot about boating in total, but uh, especially about innovation and uh, about sustainability. So for us, um, we started researching um, this uh, topic of uh, uh, boat recycling some years ago and um, we saw the problem uh, Francisca already um, uh um, told about uh, before in Germany that uh, we don't have a boat register, we don't uh, know how many boats uh, are lying around in, uh, in the berth uh, without being uh, dismantled. So for us it's very important um, to um, write about that, to inform people, um, not only in Germany be because uh, we are also writing in English uh, if it's uh, for, um, for an international uh, audience so yeah we are working together with IB, uh, with EBI already and we want to uh, give a good push uh, to this uh, stuff uh, and hope that in Germany especially um, we will get uh, further on uh, with this topic okay yes so, please Phil so yes uh, I'm I'm Phil Horton uh, I'm the environment secretary for the European Boating Association um, so we represent recreational boaters around the whole of Europe around one and a half million in total um, so we're interested in all sorts of environmental issues at the moment uh, end of life boats is one future of propulsion is another and, and anti fouling are the, the kind of three key areas that we're looking at at the moment and what we're interested in from this process we've been working with the EBI on the recommendations to the Commission is something that works for individual boaters when their boat comes to the end of its life all right thank you very much and um, yes Maria I hope my microphone is working Take yeah, yeah, no, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Maria, and I'm from a private company called Båtskruten in Sweden, and we have been uh, dismantling boats the last ten years, uh, and we have been the last four years we have been dismantling almost three thousand boats, uh, but we need a lot more. So I'm uh, very keen to discuss how to we get the boats in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, because uh, every morning when I leave, you know, my kids are asking me, "What are you doing at the boat show?" Yeah, looking at boats. Yeah, yeah, oh, very interesting. No, I'm here on a panel, and today I said it's about recycling, and um, they ask, uh, "Yeah, okay, how do you recycle a boat?" I mean, with your car, if it's 25 years old. Uh, you, you know places, you go there or you sell it as a classic car if you bought the right car 25 years ago. But uh, what do you do with boats? Uh, where is the infrastructure? Where are places? Where can they be scrapped? There's one in Sweden, we learned now. Uh, how did you, how did you uh, uh, develop your idea? How uh, we, we started as a small company just on one place south of, of, of Stockholm uh, on an archipelago island. Uh, and we, we were dragged along with our husbands to these huge boat shows. Uh, and they were telling us that we are selling, us, selling about 15 to 20,000 new bo boats every year. And, and we were thinking, okay, when the boats needs to dismantle, how, how do you manage to do that? No, no plan. And there were discussion about anti-fouling. There were uh, how to get more environmental other issues, but not the entire boat. Uh, so we started as a small company, and then uh, after a while, we we saw that it was necessary to build a national system. Uh, then we contacted Stena Recycling, who is huge in Sweden. They have about uh, 100 facilities all through Sweden. So we pointed out 28 of them uh, that you can uh, uh, turn in boats. And this was not uh, governmental founding in the beginning. It was the last owner who took the costs. And in the beginning, we got like 100 boats a year. Uh, and you can't run a business to take in 100 boats a year. So, so we, we started to search founding to, to get more boats. Uh, and now we have been dismantling 
almost 500 boats a year with the governmental funding, but uh, it's not enough. Uh, we, we have one million uh, boats in Sweden, and uh, it was since the 70s we have put one million boats uh, on the market. Before the 70s, we have 600 boats, and uh, uh, investigations show that we have 850 boats in use. That means that we have almost 800 boats who has disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what is what is then if the, without governmental funding, uh, what was would be your business case? The business was that the last owner paid for the entire the transportation, the dismantling costs, uh, and that's why we didn't get so many boats because the last owner of the boat always has the last the le least money. So. So we needed some kind of, but we have been consistent and, and our system can take a lot. We can take like 10,000 boats a year in our system, but we need to have the boats in. And we know that the boats are there somewhere on the bottom of the sea, in the shorelines, on private properties. So, so we need to figure out how to, to get the person managed to turn in the boats. Any idea from the panel? Because there are 6.5 million boats below 24 meters in the EU, EU currently. There's maybe even more uh, uh, because I don't know if we have the correct numbers. I mean, this is on the table, but maybe I mean, 7.5. I mean, I'd say that the, the challenge here is, although it sounds like large numbers compared to cars, it's a very small number. And so the difficulty is they're spread, they're spread very thinly. Um, and, and as we've already heard from Maria, the, the difficulty is that the last person that owns the boat may have paid a few hundred euros for it, and they have a, a few thousand euro liability for, for, the, for the disposal. So a system that work, is not going to work that requires the, the, the last owner of the boat to pay, pay for disposal. And the other real difference with cars is that, as we've already heard, boats last 40 to 50 years. Uh, I mean, my boat is 43 years old this year. Um, I've just put copper coat on the bottom, so I hope it's going to last at least another 10 years to make that, that worthwhile. Um, so it's, if we make decisions now about new boats and how they're handled, that's going to solve the problem in 40 or 50 years' time. It's not going to solve the problem for these, uh, this legacy fleet that we have. So we've got, we've got two different issues here. We've got the materials we're using for new boats, which is all very exciting for, uh, for development and, and research and development and so on, but we've got to find a way of dealing with that legacy fleet as it, as it comes to its end of life. And you know, transporting boats is expensive and disposing of them is expensive. And we have to find a, a solution that works for everybody and works for the boat, the boat owner as well. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, this is all about the GRP. I mean, the, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. But um, what, what can you do with the boat? I mean, um, if, you, if you try to recycle it, let me say. Yeah, yeah you too. Yes, maybe Kerstin and then. That's fine. No, you, uh, so so I, I, I think there's uh, from the, 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 the challenge, eh, let's say, of recycling composite materials is not just unique to the marine industry. Eh? I think it's also there for, for wind. It's also there for automotive and transportation. It's also there uh, for, for, for electrical applications, building and construction applications. So there's as many composites, materials applications where there is this challenge of, of recycling and then particularly for thermosets, it's a, it's a challenge because those are very durable materials. Uh, I think mostly the boats after 30 to 50 years, they are not getting at the end of life, the end of use, I would say. The composite component is still very durable and very strong. Uh, um, we, we made a, a very s small uh, overview of the, uh, the, 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 the recycling technologies. We, I think we have a slide on that. Can you, uh, can you put that on? Yes, thank you. Uh, so so th there's multiple technologies that are in, in different phases of commercial development. I'd say the, the technology which has the biggest volume capacity at the, at the moment is co-processing. It was already referred to in the, uh, in the roadmap uh, for, uh, for the, the marine roadmap that we were presented earlier today. Uh, Co-processing is, uh, is using the glass fiber from the composite material as a, as a raw material of the cement. Uh, it, it's the calcium carbonate of, the, of the, the glass replaces the calcium carbonate in the cement, uh, so it's, it's, it's a nice recycling technology. And, and, uh, and for, for multiple reasons, if you use uh, re re glass reinforced uh, composite materials as input, uh, you will help to reduce the CO2 emissions of the cement co-processing, eh? so that's, that's nice. 
the, let's say the, the, the technology works well for glass reinforced products. It works a little bit less with carbon uh, because carbon fiber by itself is extremely expensive. And so it would be very nice to recover that. Uh, so there are other technologies used for, for carbon fiber uh, that really take advantage of, that, uh, of, that, uh, of the carbon fiber and try to sell it in, in a second life. Um, we're seeing that there's uh, other technologies uh, uh, like, uh, for instance, mechanical recycling, uh, where sometimes uh, people are using the, the fibers and the fillers in new formulations, in new uh, composite formulations. Uh, there is new technologies uh, that is, uh, uh, for instance, Continuum uh, is developing these in, in Denmark, trying to take those materials into, into panel applications, combining with resins, and give them a different life and a different application. Uh, so there's, I think, different, different things. Yeah, Kerstin, you, want you wanted to add something? Yes, um, uh, our research uh, gave us a very good insight to what APEA in France is doing. And I think uh, uh, this is a really good uh, project or pilot project maybe for the whole um, European uh, um, uh, um, places. And uh, we can uh, copy this um, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, uh, because what, for example, in France, I think is very interesting is they have a tax. Um, for the recycling already when you buy the boat. Mm -hmm. So um, the owners um, uh, have to, buy, to, to pay this tax for recycling. And uh, afterwards, uh, when the boat uh, comes to, to this, its life's end, uh, then uh, uh, the government uh, is paying the other part uh, to do the, the recycling. And I think this is interesting, and maybe we could copy something like that, and afterwards, yeah, use your... <laughs> actually, actually that, that's what we had a workshop earlier, uh, earlier well, at the end of last year, uh, together with Wind Europe and with uh, the European boating industry, yeah, as well, well as... Let uh, me, let me oh, I'm sorry, uh, well, perhaps you can... Uh, no, let me ask, please, <laughs> let me ask Felicitas, I'm <laughs> asking the questions, um, <laughs> because she wanted to respond to casting. Thank you. Uh. Yes, I, I wanted to take up again your example from cars, because I think there are some aspects where you can really get compare boat with cars, but in other aspects they have totally different preconditions. Mm -hmm. So for cars and boats, they're both made of their material mix. You also have some hazardous substances or hazardous parts in it. it in many cases, it makes sense to dismantle both types of products, cars and boats. So maybe it's a good idea to learn for boats from cars. But on the other hand, I think there's a, a different precondition because as you said already, there is an infrastructure for cars. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also the issue with the, economic, um, with the economic business you said already, which is due to the carbon fibers. For cars, you have the target material is metal. So it's worth to have a recycling facility for cars because you can make money out of it. And for boats, currently, it's rather difficult because you have, at the end, you have the carbon fibers. You have to pay for it if you give it to the incineration plant. You have also to pay for it if you give it to the cement kills. So there is some recycling process, but still some economic issues as well. And to really make it more economically, you need to take out all the valuable materials from boat. So I believe that it's at some point of time, it's possible to make an business model for, for boats, but then you really have to find out which parts can I take out, can I reuse some parts, can I sell the metals, and then it yeah. can Yeah, and can you, you did the research on Germany, right? You're, so there is a good example in France, there's a good example I in Sweden, in my opinion. Why don't we have this uh, um, here in Germany, or do we have already? Because I'm not really aware. Yeah, there's actually this one recycling plant who's just trying to, to do it. They started a couple of years ago, and they are also scrap dealers who do it rather as a side business. But this also could be partly a problem because it's a side business, so maybe they don't have like a, a guideline or they only have like two boats a year. Mm -hmm. So then it's also complicated to, to recycle it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as mentioned um, by you before, there's no registration, so it's also difficult to, to have a statistic how many boats will, will come to the end of life and to, to calculate a business case you also need to know how many boats can I recycle in the, the next years so 
some kind of statistical information could be helpful. And also dismantling guidelines, what we also did in this study for cars, to cite this example again, there, there are strict regulations how you have to do it, there are guidelines also for the drainage, so, so when you take out the waste oils, the weight water, you cannot just put it somewhere, there's like a really strict regulation how you have to do it for cars, and this doesn't exist for boats. Andy, you are already nodding, yes, is this uh, something we, we need across the well, across the, Europe? The, the key word in all of this, because the, you uh, all, uh, you know, uh, uh, I suppose you're, you're agreeing, what you're saying, each one of you, is that we do not have enough flow of information and share of good practices around uh, the various countries. Mm -hmm. And we do not have the flow of knowledge of what is out there, what is working well, so that we can import it and show it to uh, uh, administrations elsewhere, and we can take up the, uh, let's say, the example of France, and maybe not duplicate it exactly, but customize it to the realities on the ground in other countries according to their le legislation in place. And on top of every, uh, on top of all of this, it's the European regulation that allows for certain things, and national administrations or regional governments whatever might be uh, the case, they all need to refer and comply with particular specific legislation out there. And legislation allows and also invites for practices like that. So it is much more elaborate and much more sophisticated to dismantle a, a pleasure boat than dismantle a car, a scooter, whatever have you. And of course, the, the, the treatment needs to be different, but it can be catered for through legislation in place. Mm -hmm. It is only the knowledge that lacks and the information and the data, statistical data to show the magnitude of the problem, a, a standardization that uh, exists in other places that can be, you know, important and duplicated in other countries as well. And this data sharing and information sharing could troubleshoot a lot of the uh, problems that we see right now. Yeah. And e with other industries as, as well, probably. Alexander, you are sitting here not without a reason. How is it going in, in your uh, industry? Yeah, no, so exactly. Uh, the, the, the odd one out on the panel, but I think um, other panels have hinted at. So in the wind industry, we use the same or very similar composite materials that the boating industry uses for the hulls, right? And therefore, we also face the same challenges. You know, what do we do when our turbines come to end of life? We need to dis decommission them. You know, we know 85 to 90 percent can easily be recycled because it's steel, it's copper, it's aluminium, well-established practices. But for the composite materials that are in the blades, I think in Germany you call them the wings of the turbine, um, we have a more challenging position where, as Thomas showed, you know, the technologies are there but we need to work on a business case, yeah? And what I've heard to hear also in the panel is we, we need to really keep mind, reminding ourselves that we're not recycling these boats or these blades just for the fun of recycling. We are recycling them because we believe they are valuable resources, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. The fibers that are in there are valuable. The, the resins, they can be broken up either in new products, uh, in monomers, they can uh, substitute, for instance, through pyrolysis, you can get an oil from the resin that can substitute uh, for the chemicals industry crude oil feedstock. So you can displace crude oil with what is left from the resin, for instance. Yeah? Or in the cement industry, you know, it replaces the raw materials. So there are values to be get. Um, the challenge is, and I've heard it here from our, our Swedish colleague, is how do I get the boats? Or if we look broader, how do I get the composite, the composite waste? Yeah, from the boats, from the wind turbines, from automotive, from aviation, yeah, from all these sectors. And if I hark back to uh, what, what Andy has said earlier, and also just now, you know, it's about uh, legislation, but it's also about traceability, yeah? Visibility on data. And I think one of the elements here of data that is important is the volumes. What amount of composite waste, yeah, be it from boats, 
be it from late, is out there. Yeah, when is it being decommissioned? Where is it? Yeah, so, uh, and here it's important, I think, uh, to look indeed at you know, the waste framework yeah, at EU level. How do we identify waste? And at the moment, composite materials are classified as construction and demolition waste, mm -hmm. which is one third of all of EU's waste. Which means if you want to look for a decommissioned boat or a decommissioned blade that's you know, at a, a waste yard yeah, by a waste management company, it's like a needle in a haystack at the moment. Because yeah? for them, it's, it's a line in an Excel file. Yeah? Do you have to go on the yard just to try and find it? So I think if we create dedicated waste codes for composite materials, yeah, for boats, for blades, we combine them, then we can better access, we can better pool those resources, mm -hmm. and then companies can then really see and develop a business case. They know how much material there will be, how much they can handle, they can scale up with all of that. Um, in the short term, of course, we're only scratching the surface. The volumes will be bigger for boats, volumes will be bigger for, uh, for wind turbine blades as well. So we will receive probably that you know, in Sweden, in France, for us in Germany and in Spain, you know, first projects will start to grow, but they will need also access to materials, boats, blades, etc., from other countries. So we also need to look at transport there. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thomas, you want to add? Uh, I, I was going to add a, a small comment. Eh? I think that you know the, the numbers that we've been talking about. Uh, the European, uh, UCI has done a uh, calculation, an estimation of the amount of composite waste being generated in Europe. And uh, we believe it's in the order of 400 kilotons today uh, per year. Uh, for, uh, for wind, I think uh, you've been talking about something like 35 kilotons uh, plus production waste, another 15 something like 50. Uh, we talked, uh, we heard earlier, uh, around 15, 20 uh, from, from marine applications. Uh, so there is a big gap between what we have identified in those two industries compared to the total. And you're very right, uh, we need to find better ways to, to track those volumes, uh, to find those. And uh, we, we've, we're working on, on setting up some, uh, some, uh, well, uh, some specific programs to gather those uh, those data yeah. and to gather yeah. that information. But it will be very, very practical. How many boats uh, reach their, their end of life now in Germany within the next years? And what will happen to them and what happened to them in the past 10 years? Because if there's just one company here uh, scrapping these, um, I wonder where are they? What are they doing with all that stuff? Yeah, so as I said, there's no statistical data available, so I can only uh, tell you some numbers from empirical studies we, we checked for Germany. So it, uh, about a little bit less than 4,000 boats reach the end of life a year. So we also saw the numbers before in the, the presentation. So this is equivalent to maybe 8,000 um, fiber composite material. But we expect there's much more boats outside. So they are laying in uh, marinas, they are somewhere, maybe they have, have no owner anymore, someone inherited those boats and no one knows anymore um, what to do with them. So if there's some incentive to also give this um, boats to, to a scrapyard or to some recycling plant, I could imagine that more boats are reaching the end of life because then there's an incentive to, to give them. But yeah, already 4,000 are a number. And it's, it's a year, and if I hear the numbers from Sweden, they are similar numbers in Sweden, but not all these boats come to the recycling plant. So I think we're, it's good to start with what we, we have before we ask all the others to, to hand in their boats before we have the, the infrastructure. And yes, currently we saw that there are mainly two paths of what, what owners do with their boats. They uh, cut it down themselves when it's a small boat that's maybe possible to, to cut it, to shred it, and then give the fiber composites to, to some recycling yard or directly to an incineration plant, then not necessarily to a cement kiln, but just to a common incineration plant. And they are not, yeah, most of them report that they are not that happy about receiving the, the fiber composite. And the other path is that you have to, to pay for it as also mentioned in, in Sweden, the last owner pays for it. So it's up to m it's more than 1,000 euro a boat mm -hmm. to a recycling plant or scrap dealer who then, yeah, I would say it's mainly 
three steps a recycler is doing. You have first uh, the drainage, or first, maybe even before you have the transport, because you cannot really dismantle it on place. Then the drainage to take out the, the liquids, to take out the hazardous materials, and then there's some removal of valuable materials, and yeah, then cutting it down, shredding it, and then looking that every material can have a new, ha you know, can go that's it's in its waste stream. Mm -hmm. Is it the same with the car, or no? It's completely different because uh, when you give the car away, I mean, you get 100 euros, and you don't, pay, uh, you did, do not pay 1,000. Um, yeah, yeah, but I think that's because you know. So right, right now we're talking from your know, owners paying to get the boat dismantled because you know the dismantling companies. What do they? What can they do with the waste that they then have? They need to maybe sell in small volumes, whereas, of course, in the car industry, there is value in mm -hmm. the scrap car, like the steel, the other materials as well. There is an industry there that sees value in the end-of-life car, whereas at the moment, there is not yet an industry that sees value in end-of-life boats as you know, the materials that are behind it. I think we need to change that mindset, um, and as soon as somebody sees that value, and I think there is a tremendous value. Like the cement industry is moving in that industry. Uh, the chemicals sector is also interested in getting back those monomers. You know, then we can really drive that forward and th we can get reach that scale much, much easier. Maria, yes. How, how is it I, yeah. exactly? <laughs> Yeah, if there were value in the industry of boating, there would be boat dismantling company everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have a problem. But the boats aren't made to, to dismantle. If, if a car take away a car part, you can get money for it. But uh, we, in the beginning, we take, took away everything. Uh, the winches, the, the everything. And we put it on a shell. And it was laying there for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very expensive parts. And to take, take something off takes an hour or two. So I think that we need to start to think about this when we build the boats. Mm -hmm. So we have to work on different kind of levels here. It's the historic waste is, uh, is one issue. The new boats that are building, it's another issue. And I think that in Europe, we need to, to get this common goal uh, what, what is the problem? It's boating uh, a littering problem, or is it an uh, environmental problem, or is it just if you put something on the market, you <coughs> have to take it away? If we, if we can define this goal, and then we can work towards that in the same direction, every one of us. Are we going to have the production responsibility? Uh, are we, which level do we have that? Is it informative, or is it fully financial? It, it, we, need to, we need to just clear out this question, every one of us, to... Yes, think. absolutely. Uh, Phil, you have a good I overview. Th I, was, I was just thinking about the, the proposal that's been put to the Commission, which is really a kind of pathway towards that full circularity. And I think we have to recognise we don't have solutions now that means we can take all of those materials out of the boats and reuse them in a new product properly. So, you know, the interim of, of waste to energy and then having uh, co-processing with, with cement cells and so on is a useful kind of step on the way. And I guess it comes back to the fact that the boats last so long. So we've got to have that, that period of time. We can't have a solution now that, that sol solves everything. But ultimately, we do need to get to the point where those materials have a value. And there, there probably is a place there for regulation as well, where you have to find a way of insisting on the use of that material in new products, because then it has a value. At the moment, it doesn't have sufficient value, as, as, as others have said. Um, and I can't see a way towards that. I mean, we've seen it with other forms of plastics, haven't we, where regulations have come in to say a percentage of new product has to be from recycled um, materials. And then businesses then struggle to get enough of that recycled content, which is a good news story. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to get, then get that uh, material out of the waste stream to, to reuse it. And I think there is a place there for some regulation as well. Um, and it also just made me think again this, this question of, of, of who pays. Um, if we continue to make the last user of the boat, the last owner of the boat responsible, boats aren't going to last as long because that liability is going to be sitting there. Um, and so I think it's really important that we don't create um, 
impacts that we don't expect from, from the rules that we, bring, we put into play. So something like a, a registration scheme for boats that runs all through its life is a complex way of dealing with it. I do think the kind of extended producer responsibility, the APER model in France, is probably the way to go. It keeps it simple for us boaters, and it, it means that the boat is dealt with properly at end of life. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, um, uh, you already said uh, lots of very interesting solutions and I think we have to have in mind as well the LCA, uh, the Life uh, Circle is, uh, uh, Assessment. And so this um, brings us to uh, start thinking in building the boat and already knowing what, uh, what will come out afterwards and what we have to dismantle mm -hmm. and which waste we, we have. So I was very, uh, it was, for me it was very interesting. Yesterday I was talking with uh, Erwan Fouchier from, from uh, uh, Benetton and he's as well the president of APER and he said um, in France um, the dismantling uh, gives 50% back or you can, you can uh, it's not waste, but you can recycle 50% of the boat already in France. So I think uh, this sounds good, could be much better, I think. But uh, so if we start now um, making new composites um, and, and making more natural fiber composites, for example, and as well informing people, because I think, uh, um, yeah, you can... Media is very important uh, to inform and uh, to make uh, um, to to bring this idea of uh, uh, that boating uh, is uh, creating waste uh, to to the people. Uh, this is yeah. necessary. And uh, what um, uh, what you said before that the boats uh, are used not only by one person but by uh, several people. So it is very important that. Uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, there is f a tax or something like that, where um, you already uh, have some money, um, which afterwards uh, dismantling, perhaps normally the people who, are, who, who use the boat uh, at last uh, have not so much money as the people who buy the boat at yeah, the first. Most of us never buy a new boat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but the, uh, <laughs> our composite uh, experts here, are there any new materials around? I mean, for example, Boris Herrmann with this, you know, this Malizia cruising around the world, they are using flax. Um, it's a natural material, and if okay. he proves this is reliable, this could be a game changer, in my opinion. Well, uh, there's two aspects to that, I would say. Uh, one aspect is that uh, for sure you can use more recycled materials into, into the resins. Uh, so for instance, uh, you, can make, uh, you can use waste PET bottles and you can make resins out of that, uh, for instance. Uh, and we're working on, on materials for, uh, for, for marine applications for making boats, uh, for, for sure. That's one, uh, that's one direction. Um, I think that, that changing as existing raw materials to bio raw materials is, is not necessarily always a good thing for a life cycle analysis, a life cycle footprint for, of, a, of a boat. Uh, typically, the, the large volume chemicals that we use as raw materials for making resins, they are pro uh, they're produced in, in large plants, uh, which are very energy efficient, very big scale operations. So the, the footprint of those raw materials is very low. And if you go to change to, to bio-based raw materials, which are produced today in small scale, and, and sometimes competing uh, with, 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 with food. As, as that's as, as only what they, uh, uh, they are only available like that. It's not necessarily a, an improvement in an LCA. Uh, but that's, that's I, I would say uh, we, we go through a transition there. Uh, and I think that the short term, uh, there's definitely opportunities for using more recycled materials. Uh, longer term, uh, we will have to go to additional raw material sources and more of them will be bio and second generation, eh, whatever, third, fourth generation sources. Uh, and, and, and that will, that will improve, uh, but that's not going to happen in the next one or two years. Uh, and I think on the, on the fiber side, I, uh, I, I do believe that there is definitely room uh, for additional types of fibers, uh, beyond glass fibers, even beyond uh, carbon fibers. Uh, but, but all fibers have their specific benefits and, and also limitations. And then particularly in an aqueous environment, uh, well, flex fibers uh, with, with, uh, and some of the organic fibers uh, with their sensitivity to moisture, uh, there, there is 
some limitations that you, you may not be able to use them for uh, direct water contact, but, but for other parts you may be able to use them. Eh? So I guess there's a bit of a combination and, and that will determine, uh, that, that will be determined uh, by the specific uh, requirements of the, uh, of the part involved. Okay, yeah, Cassie, yeah. 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 Um, uh, I have a very good example in Germany. Um, there is green boats, um, uh, and uh, green boats are already using uh, flex fiber composites. So uh, they, there is one boat, one sailing boat here on the show. You can okay. see that. Okay. And um, I was uh, researching together with uh, Friedrich Daimann, who is uh, uh, from Green Boats, mm -hmm. and, uh, with the university in Bremen. Mm -hmm. And they made uh, a lot of uh, experiments uh, with this uh, uh, flex fiber uh, composites. Mm -hmm. And they were really, really positive. So I think there is much more music in, in that than we, uh, than we still believe or we still have in mind. And yep. uh, this, uh, the footprint, the carbon footprint of, uh, of all these uh, um, materials are much, much better because uh, uh, they are growing and growing means uh, um, they are reducing uh, uh, the, the carbon fiber footprint. I, I think uh, we, as, as, as industry, eh, and I think that is, uh, it's, it's uh, marine industry, but also ad additional uh, composite applications, uh, I think we're very open uh, to, to change that. And actually, we, we'd like to promote uh, the use of more, more uh, sustainable materials. Eh? So I think that's uh, it's, it's good, uh, nice to hear. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more afterwards. Yeah, yeah this is no. already on the no. water. I mentioned this example, but Felicitas uh, wanted to add something yeah, to uh, Kerstin or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, I want to to underline again that for me, a circular economy is always like a back-looking and a forward-looking task. So we have both challenges. So on the one hand, we have the all the historic boats. For them, it's no need to redesign them, they are already there. We have to tackle this issue. We have to recycle them, we have to, to find an infrastructure for them. And then we have the second challenge, with the, what do we do with the new boats? Is there an option for redesign for new materials? Mm -hmm. But also here I would like to highlight that it's always a kind of a trade-off because we also have the fiber composites there. We heard already they have a long life, they are durable. So we also need to find other materials that have the same or other benefits. So for example, if we say we have another material, maybe it's not that durable, but on the other hand, it can be recycled more easily. Then we can see, is it worth the trade-off? Maybe then we have shorter lifetime, but better recycling. So I think this is also the task for when new materials get developed. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But I like to, because I don't know who is watching, we want to motivate some people. I like to bring <laughs> in Maria as, again. Uh, how complicated was it to establish the business? Um, is it really exhausting? No, it is not, because we need more of you. Uh, in the beginning, it was very exhausting. We couldn't get a company insurance because we didn't get the code, because a boat dismantling company doesn't exist. So in the beginning, it was really difficult. And I think it was difficult to convince people that, they were, uh, th that there was a cost uh, because in the beginning, everyone tried to sell their boats to us. Uh, and we, we asked them, uh, okay, no, it's fu fully functional, uh, but I can't have it. And I tried to sell it on this selling marketing on, online, but I couldn't sell it. But you can buy it cheap. So 200 we only. <laughs> yeah, we have a dismantling company. So it took us almost five years to convince people uh, to... to that they need to pay something to dismantling the boat, that, that there was a service. Uh, and now uh, we are so glad that people who get the boat, because there, there was uh, a lot of boats who was given away uh, for free online because they couldn't do anything with them. And they called us and, okay, I'm going to get this boat for free. And I, I just wonder how much do I need to pay when, when I need to dismantling. So I think uh, we are getting there. Uh, and that's quite bright for the future, actually. But we need to get there a little bit faster, because if we take like 500 boats a year, but we need to take 4,000 or 10,000 a year to just even up this. Uh, so we need to have the governmental help or funding or something. But if the money is there, if the, if, if the material is, have some kind of value or if we can get money from the other way, we can solve this, I think. Mm -hmm. 
uh, yeah, the last word has Andy, Andy, because there are, I think, how many programs, if you like to set up something similar? <laughs> uh, programs, to, to funding programs in uh, the European Union, you can find many. And they can cater for all the needs of the European economy, for sure. But it is aggregating aligned interests that it is out there in industries like, uh, and Alexander uh, mentioned uh, before, the similarities that exist in uh, dismantling and scrapping uh, wind uh, turbine blades and uh, leisure boats, you need to come, these aligned interests will make more impact if they are communicated properly. And if they go together to fund common solutions uh, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, be it uh, dismantling or be it innovation on new composite materials that uh, can uh, have a longer duration, longer lifetime, etc., etc. Innovation, it's not a problem. Funding, it's not a problem. The only problem you might have is navigate uh, your way through the various uh, funding instruments out there. And uh, uh, regulation, legislation can be uh, uh, recipients, uh, we can be recipients of the claims of the industry to calibrate better whatever exists out there, revise certain issues and make for a more tiered approach, if you like, for certain issues that are now uh, uh, tackled suboptimally, if you feel. So that would be my uh, last words here for the audience today, I hope. It's a good final statement. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have a break of two, three minutes because we have to exchange the microphones. Thank you very much. Have a good show. Absolutely interesting this morning. <laughs>